Hi, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You're listening to Living the Wildlife, discussing all things related to vertebrate pest control as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. This is the disclaimer for wildlife control consultant and pest geek podcast for Living the Wildlife podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Really glad to have you on board. As you can tell, we have a guest today, but before we uh, go to him, we just want to review again what we're what we're all about. We're about research-based information about all things related to the wildlife control field, including the business aspect, which we are, of course, going to be discussing today. If you have questions, comments, concerns, you can definitely reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. Yes, even the criticisms, we'll, we'll take those as well. If you're interested in being on the show, definitely reach out. I think there's a lot of information out there that needs to be more widely disseminated, definitely reach me again at that email address, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to the channel and give us a review. We'd certainly appreciate that. And don't forget to ring the bell so you can be uh, kept abreast of updates. And I also publish on Rumble. You can see me there over at Wildlife Control Consultant. Today, our guest is Bob Williamson. He is the director involved in the Pest Control Division of CETANE Associates. That's C-T-A-N-E, C-E-T-A-N-E dot com. And he is a sell-side broker <clears throat> of businesses. So we're going to learn today about the importance of preparing your company to sell. I know, I know a lot of you guys don't want to be thinking about that. You're going to be working to 103 But for those few of you that may want to be looking at selling a little bit earlier than 103, uh, Bob is going to be talking about that today for us. So, Bob, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. I am glad to be here. Great. Why don't you tell us a little about yourself and what you do for people looking to sell their companies? I am I'm I'm live in eastern southeastern Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia, Um, Penn State graduate many years ago. And I'm current position is I work for C10 Associates as a sell side broker. So we're a relatively large firm of about 20 employees across the country that help people sell their business. So we take your business when you're ready to sell or thinking you're going to sell at some point. We help prepare you for the sale. We get your information and then we go out and we shop your business. And, and our job is to get you the best offer. For the, for the buyer that you're most comfortable with. So we work the entire process. We take it from the beginning confidentiality agreement all the way through to closing is when we really get paid. So we try to make sure we do it the right way. What would you say is the, now that people in you know my age, I'm getting up closer to the 60, 60 year old mark. And of course my generation's looking toward retirement more and more. What do you think is the biggest misunderstanding that many people have about their pest control or wildlife control business when they're looking to sell? What is, if you could like fix one thing that they, that you wish clients would, would grasp before they reach out to you, what are they missing? The, the biggest misunderstanding is understanding the value of your business and understanding how to get a value of your business. And where do you go to get some estimation on what your business can sell for and how to best sell it? And that cannot that can go way beyond what your accountant will give you mm-hmm. because there's a lot of um, intrinsic industry um, dynamics that happen based on the kind of business you have and how it works. Okay. So all businesses have value, and there's a lot you can do, especially if you're a few years away to um, increase your value and make your business more saleable. And I mean, we are, I'm 60, I'm 65 in a few weeks. So the boomer generation is aging out 
So, you know, the number of people in our age group that turn 65 every day is staggering. So these are these are our customers because they're all going to look up at some point and realize they need to consider selling their business. So what are some of the metrics used to value value business? The, the metrics are, are multiple. Um, the, the EBITDA metric is the most commonly one you hear, where EBITDA is an accounting term, standing for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So your EBITDA is, if you're a million-dollar business, we kind of need to understand what your EBITDA might be, and we can go through and adjust that. We can get your tax return, but it's not, it's not as... Three different people, Steve, can come up with three different EBITDA. Right. So it's it's uh, it's a very it's not a real simple number. So when someone says they got a certain multiple of EBITDA, it really depends what the EBITDA was. And right. there's different ways to skin that cat. And the EBITDA could be different from one buyer to the next. So okay. my EBITDA on your business is going to vary from the other buyer. And there's reasons for that. So. So we go through all that and try to understand the, the appetite based on that. And there are other dynamics of the business are, you know, the, the, the stability of the revenue. So what happens to the revenue um, if I buy it? If it's stable, how do I know I'm going to get the revenue? How risky is the revenue? How much will the owners not being there influence the revenue? So if, if I'm buying a business and Steven is the superstar guy on the ladder all day, and he retires, I really don't have a whole lot left other than doing the job Steven had. So you really have to put a lot of those dynamics into play and say, well, what would this be worth? And who is the best buyer based on that? And we get all kinds of, we get a ton of inquiries every day across the country saying, what do you think I'm worth? And there's all kinds of mythical multiples that they might be worth based on what their buddy told them or they read in a magazine <laughs> right. and, and they're, they're getting information from all different sources. Yes. And there's, there's a lot of variables that go into it. And, and, yeah. there's a, and I have in my previous life of 35 years, I was a buyer and I bought close to 40 companies in the Philadelphia region. Wow. So I'm pretty familiar. And I, and I bought a lot of different type businesses because I was in nine different things. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of different structure for people from a really small guy doing a quarter million to a guy doing $10 million. So it varied tremendously. And I, I basically could work with any of the above. Yeah. So the EBITDA issue, because I do a little bit of invest, I do some investing in stocks. And so not that I'm very good, but okay. um but yeah, it makes because it's a lot more fungible, right? Because you have companies that can sort of tweak their earnings. And that's why some people are moving more toward cash flow because it's harder to tweak that. Is that does that sound about right? Yeah, it's it it, it kind of sorta. I mean, if you're claiming all your revenue would be the first step. If you're putting it all in your tax returns, that makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. On a business this size, these businesses are not publicly held. It's normally um, pretty similar. You know, you can go in and look at it and understand it. We typically will ask the owner, like, what else do we need to know about the business that maybe mm. we're not seeing on your tax return? Right. So if you're, if you're paying, if Steve decides to pay for his vacation house through his business, right. okay, we don't <laughs> care, okay? We're not, we're not looking to play gotcha on Steve. We just need right. to understand that that $32,000 expense that's categorized in some obtuse manner is really Steve's vacation house. Right. And we need to get there. If, you know, if he's buying, if he's running his wife's car through the business, she doesn't work in the business. It's it, we don't care, but we need to understand that because that will influence the EBITDA. Right. And yeah. is, do you find you were talking about the, the role of the owner in the business. And I think that's certainly yeah. a fair, a fair point specifically because a lot of the wildlife control businesses are single person operations. Yeah. Do you, is it harder for you to sell a business that's, that's identified by the name of the owner, as opposed to a, a neutral name that's not owner based? 
or does now, that not so, matter? Uh, the, the name doesn't really matter. I okay. don't think you need to um, change a name to something generic. In fact, I I find in buying locally here, I, I kind of like names that I can relate to somebody somewhere <laughs> instead of some a pithy name that they came up with um, at some point. Okay. It, it, it has more to do, Stephen, with what happens what happens when the owner leaves? Right. And when you go on vacation, do you just shut down and let the phones go to voicemail and and wait to come back to respond to your calls? Or do you have another person who fills in and does it almost as well as you? So what, what happens when you're away? And it's pretty important to us when we're selling. I have one I'm doing now nearby in Western Pennsylvania with the owners on two weeks vacation. And the business is running fine. So that means whoever That's, buys the business can do can the run same it with thing. That deal. Yeah. Yeah. He could yeah. be away for two weeks. He's 75 years old. He takes vacations. Yeah. And the fact that he can go away. And when I'm on the phone with him, he's not interrupted 17 times <laughs> with calls. I have other guys <laughs> that I can't. I just had a guy in due diligence, a pest guy, sell three B jobs. In the middle of due diligence. Um, and I said, I, I said, I think I'm impressed, but I'm really annoyed because right. you know, I'm trying to get something done. And you're, and he does it, but we're so busy. So, you know, so what happens when he's away right. for the day? Right. And, right. and ironically, yeah. it's funny. When this guy does go away, him and his wife are big cruise fanatics. Yeah. They go on long cruises. So they do go away. But when he's yeah. there, he is Just... he's like – tremendously like super scatterbrained answering his phone. So, but, but the, the key, Stephen is a guy that's a one man band, you know, what, what, what does it look like when he leaves? And, and this is, this is why we like to talk to people years before they want to sell that the best relationship for us is, Hey, can we talk about maybe three years from now when I'm 67, whatever number you have in your head, I want to be ready. So, we can put together four or five things you can do. And it's kind of like selling your house. You know, you may want to paint the guest room. We're not going to make you put a deck on the back or put an addition on because it's not going to be worth it. But there are some right. things you can do to position yourself to sell your business and have and get some income at the end. Sure. So I would I would suspect that would be build your continuing client list those people with longer term contracts year over year contracts would be important to build that list right recurring services and the definition of recurring is that they go from year to year automatically they don't have they don't need a contract they just continue and the the other component of a recurring service is that you schedule it and they don't so that when when May comes around, you're doing Mr. Smith's um, rodent job because you have it scheduled for three times a year. So now you have work when you turn the calendar that you can schedule ahead. Because obviously, if you're scheduling work and you're in you're in uh, a town, you're going to do it when you're there and not right. be running around being inefficient. Right. So getting people on some sort of recurring service is good. The other, and I'm going to get, this is going to get a little wild, but the other component to that is reoccurring service. Okay. So there's recurring. Yeah. Where you go from year to year and there's reoccurring. Okay. Definition of reoccurring means that you call me every year. Okay. So, and that may not be every year. It's typically not literal, but every year Stephen's wife calls me and says, I got this, I got this problem again. And okay. I can show on my financials that for the past nine years, I've done his house, eight of them. Right. She has to call me on a Friday afternoon and demand that I'm there in an hour or she's going to lose her stuff. So, you know, that's reoccurring. And reoccurring is, it's a nice trend to show that these people call you every year. Mm -hmm. But the ideal way to handle that would be, you know what, Mrs. Smith, would it make sense if we put you on a calendar for every year at this time so that we don't have, so we can make sure this doesn't happen again? You know, we'll put you on a calendar. We'll, we'll email you or text you. We're, we're coming next week, yeah. but you know, that way we get you scheduled. So you don't have to wait for this problem to develop because we pretty much every summer can count on this happening. 
Right. And, and and maybe we need to come out twice a year because that's our best program. And Mrs. Smith, if we do that, we can give you a, a savings because if we schedule it, we tend to be more efficient with our time. Mm -hmm. So if we know we're going to come out in May and we're going to come out in September, we're able to put you on a schedule and text you and call you and make sure you know we're on the way. It, we won't do it without your head nod, perhaps, but we will let you know we're coming. Right. And, and that's and that's kind of a slow morph over to a recurring service. And, right. and, and it's 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 a it's a discipline that that the pest people have learned pretty well is yeah. on the phone is you have to have that discipline because if 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 you're able to train your staff and yourself to say would it make sense for us to get you on some kind of schedule so that it would it would make life easier for you um you're gonna bat um well above 50 percent you might bat 50 percent but let's face it at the end of the day, you're, you're going to develop revenue that you have better control over and can be scheduled. And that's going to make your life better because when you come in on Monday and you and you go to your voicemail or whatever you use, you're going to have that work set up ahead of time. Right. Does, where do contracts or renewal, like some wildlife control operators do have warranties for their work where there's, you know, say someone did a bad exclusion on a house and they will have a, an annual warranty where, where does, where would that fit in? Would that fit into recurring or reoccurring? That's uh, recurring when it's a, okay. it's a, um, when there's a, a yearly, uh, we call them in the termite side, they're yearly termite renewals. Okay. For my job, somewhat analogous to a bat job, although mm -hmm. you're gonna, I'm probably crossing a line here. No, 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 that's fine. I okay. think it's analogous. Yeah. So, so a termite job, you're gonna do it, and and say that you know, for us to warranty this, we need to come back every year. If we can't get in and see your house, we can't we can't give you a guarantee that the termites aren't coming back. So if you violate the warranty, we you're on your own. Because we, as long as we get a look at it every year and we see something, we can treat it before yeah. it becomes an issue. Yeah, yeah. And and those we in in the industry of of YTRs, and we were good at it where I was. We were doing a lot of we were doing fifteen million of pests, and we probably had a million dollars a year of yearly termite renewal. Yeah. So that's a million dollars a year of letting people know you're going to come back out and take a look, and you can. The best part of those, Stephen is you can do it when you're slow. Right. So you're having a slow week and, and the phone isn't ringing, it's raining or whatever happens in your in your region. You're not going to schedule the, the renewal warranties in your busy season. Right. You're going to go out in your off season because you can take a look and say, everything looks good. I cleaned out a little bit. I saw some things starting and I took the liberty of doing, you kind of want to find ways to add a little value mm -hmm. inside the home and maybe point out things that they may want to take care of. So when you're there, you might see, again, I'm not an expert. You might see rodent droppings right. yeah. that, that, you know, they may want to sell. Let me show you this. I just took a picture of these in your basement and this is something I would be concerned about. Right. These are, these are mice or rats or whatever, armadillos or whatever i'm from philly so we don't have armadillos in right. philly that they would, they would probably eat and kill but them. You're, you're using it as an opportunity to even cross sell and maybe upsell to another service that you could provide as and, well and yeah, correct and, yeah. and it's, nice to, it's nice when you're in a home to add value um like when you're in a home and point things out that you yeah. know this, these are things that i just i kind of have an obligation as a professional to point these things out right because you know and your eyes are trained um, when you're in an industry, I, I grew up in the lawn care industry out of Penn State. I was a golf course superintendent, and I could drive by lawns doing 70 miles an hour and identify diseases <laughs> because you know right. I I knew that I knew what they look like from far away. Right. I knew that I knew the pattern. I knew the general modeling. I knew the time of year. I knew the environment, and and it was an easy observation. I could look at any tree. And tell you what kind of tree it was, because I I studied trees in school, and there's a different shape, and there's a different leaf, and there's a different bark, and after a while it becomes your eye gets trained to, to identify that. 
Right. Are there, are there any differences in selling from your perspective and your experience from selling to an external buyer as opposed to someone who is maybe selling their their business to children or to someone who's already in the business? Maybe they're selling it to an employee. Is there a is it the same process or are there different nuances with those types of sales? Typically the short answer is totally different to, okay. that, to that question. So if you're, if you decide you have a child you want to sell it to or an employee, a loyal employee who, who has interest, that is where you would have a, someone do a business valuation mm-hmm. and come up with a number and say your business is worth a half a million dollars. And, um, and you may opt to say, well, it's my son, and I'm going to sell it to him for a discount, which is totally up to you. So at that point, then you would be able to operate on a third party value. It's, okay. it's, it's nice to at least know what we think the business would be worth. Mm-hmm. And we do business valuations for that purpose. Uh, unfortunately, they're often around divorces and, and they're usually yeah. a little more in an ugly environment. Yeah. But um, for we've done them for parent to child, although typically they work that out on their own mm-hmm. without involving a third party. Um, okay. They they typically work out a deal where they can they can both do it. It's it's not easy, and and I I tell them when their kids are doing when their kids are attorneys and lawyers and they're doing other things, and they want nothing to do with the business. That might be the best thing you could hear as a parent um, versus involved. So it's. Yeah. I've always said you're you're blessed that your kids don't want to be in the business because it makes your life a lot easier as you age out of it. Interesting. So that that's a different perspective because I've always been, well, I shouldn't say always. I in more recent years I've been quite concerned over the number of people that don't seem to be willing to take over their parents' business. And I've just felt a little sadness over that because I think some of these folks are giving up a major opportunity. Now, I, I'm, I understand there's sometimes family dynamics that are a problem. But that aside, sometimes people have great relationships with their parents and still don't want to do it. And I'm like, really? I mean, it seems, boy, it seems like such a blessing because some of these businesses are quite valuable. I, I, I never have been, been in that environment. I've always... Um, when my kids are off doing different things, which yeah. would be my desire. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think um, I think Thanksgiving would be different. I well, think uh, I think true. every family dynamic would be different. There's yeah. always people that have it. I, I, and I I sell a lot of businesses owned by brothers and sisters and siblings and partners, and yeah. and they are harder to sell. Yeah, I, there's, I there's would dynamic. Feel. There's two people in the room. They both have to be ready to sell. Yeah. Um, their spouses involved. Spouses have opinions. Yeah. Um, they're they're they get my brother, his brother makes more than him, or whatever happens within a family dynamic. I don't envy any of it. it it's certainly from a broker standpoint, harder for us. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I've had many kids take over and do a better. I have a bis- I have a friend of mine in the Florida in the Gulf Coast of Florida where his son is he went to he went to school he got his MBA at University of Florida and the kid is um, he's 25 going on 40 and um, he's doing and, and I said to his dad like where did you where did you what did you do for this he's just smart and he's a, and he's really into the business side and he's a good leader so that's a great ex- I, I I would I would I would hire him to run my business. Right, so right. That's a very fortunate case um, that he is both um, more educated than his dad was at this point in a good way. Right, And right. he's also very familiar with the business and has really solid people skills for a 25-year-old. Yeah. So there are cases where it's great. Sure, There's a lot sure. of cases. I have other cases where they're, they're 27 going on 16. And um, the parents are kind of waiting to see them step up, and, and it ain't happening. Happen. It's not and, happening, um, no. and that's just you know that's just the kid, perhaps. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but that's a tough situation, and then they they feel a need to try to get them in, but they're they're sixty seven, their kids twenty eight, and it ain't happening. Yeah. So um, you have to make a decision what to do. So are there ways, uh, I wanted to just circle back to, because you talked about a a three-year time horizon if someone was looking to retire. 
would you uh what would be the most in the future that someone should be looking at would you say five years or three is a three year kind of the sweet spot like if you're getting think, serious you need to start really ratcheting things up in this three year level I, I, yeah i think it's a great question i think steve three years is is the answer but i think that the answer to the five-year perspective is if it's five years that falls to me under are they looking at ways to improve their business constantly yeah. Right, right. If they're, okay. if they're going to industry meetings and they're talking to people like me, or I'm not the only guy out there, but if they're talking to people to get advice and they're following it and they're doing things correctly, they're already doing all the right things, perhaps, because they're asking questions and they're curious. And curious people are always do better because they want to understand what can they do to better run their business. Gotcha. And, and they're getting advice from people like me that have done it for 35 years and made a lot of mistakes that are very willing to share what we do. Um, there's, you know, there's always some individual realization, uh, but let's face it, if they're out there getting advice, there's a good chance they're going to know what they need to do. Right. I'm going to tell them, what are you doing to sell recurring service? And they're going to, they're going to say, well, my industry doesn't have recurring service. Right. And then we're going to go through the drill. Well, here's, here's a process. Here's what you have to do when they call. You have to be disciplined and say, um, um, would it make sense, which is my favorite line because it's what it, it's kind of really a soft sell. Would mm -hmm. it make sense, Mr. Smith, to have us schedule this ahead of time so that we don't run into this situation again? And it's a it's a great way to get them to say yes and then say, here's what here's what we'll do. I'll put you on the calendar in May and I want to put you on twice a year because I think this problem requires a little more attention and I can, I can schedule it and do it for less money now because I can schedule it and we both benefit. All right. So there's ways to do that. Yeah, no, yeah. I think those are, those are good points. And I just want to encourage the audience while you're listening to this, you're, you're, you're getting some important gems. If you're, you should be, those of you that are new in the business, you should be looking down the road in the future. I know it's a long way away, but how could I value my business and improve it to sell? Those of you that are a little bit more longer in the tooth, as they say, you need to be thinking about wh what is your transition plan? Because uh, you might, when you're trying to sell, you might get a reality check that you weren't quite emotionally prepared for. And now is the time to have that check yeah. rather than when you're like, I need to sell now because my body is so busted up, I've got to get out of the business. I mean, prepare while the sun is shining, right? Make hay while the sun shines. And so this, I know these are difficult things for people that are crisis driven, like we are in our business, but you've got to start planning work on your business rather than be, rather than the business running you. Right. So this is, this is important information. Do you have advice for how, uh, strategies for how people who are involved in a, uh, a partnership, perhaps maybe they have a business relationship with family members on how they could uh, un deal with valuation questions and selling questions before one of the partners needs to sell. Are there strategies there that you would suggest? I understand you're not a lawyer, but uh, there are but, things that you've seen people do to work some of that out. Well, the, the, the easiest ones are to talk about it and talk about what your plans may be and okay. have a discussion and say, you know, we're going to be partners. We need to talk about what happens when one of us decides they want to get out. What is that going to look like? And how do we process that ahead of time when right now we're the furthest thing from it, but it's going to be very important that we have a buy sell option that when I want to get out, we have a way to value the business and you can buy me out. Or I can go to a third party, but those are all those are conversations that we that many people don't have. I have partners now that haven't really spoken to each other in years, and they worked in the same building, and they actually kind of get along. Okay, this they not so it's not it's just <laughs> I call it I call it um, functionally dysfunctional is my right. psychological definition. I like that. Okay, yeah. Okay, so it, it it's not <laughs> not. You, if you ask them if there's an issue, they would both say no, and I think they're right. Okay, but but they don't communicate. They don't about communicate, it. yeah. And that's um, and that's not uncommon. So yeah, they're they're not. There's no hostility. 
Yeah. Um, it's just what happens. So yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to be a partner with one of my brothers. I, I just can't imagine how it would go, but it, it right. happens quite often. Sure. Right. Sure. So what have the, saying? have the conversation. Do you advise people to consult a lawyer and try to work out a, a system? Like, you know, like I've always thought businesses like that should have a, like a share program where they could sell out their part or have the opportunity for their partner to buy them out and have those terms in writing and how they would evaluate it. Maybe getting three, three estimates and, or a third party to evaluate it and then, sell so that you kind of anticipate totally. some of and these objections all all great ideas and all great ideas to do way before you ever need to yeah all <laughs> things to do before you're in this situation okay before it's raining you know plan for rain and and that'll happen and do this stuff ahead of time all right the other stuff Stephen, that you can do to add value that's really easy kind of like painting your guest room yeah is is you know staying disciplined on price increases um uh, you should really increase your price every year and you don't need to raise it a lot but every year you should consciously raise your price yep. and and the reasons for that are that nobody cares when you wait three years and then you adjust they, yes. don't, they don't thank you for the past three years you haven't right and secondly in in our industry and I couple this with pest control and everything yep. else that I've been involved in. Labor, we sell labor. And labor costs more every year. Right. So people want raises, you want to make more money, you have bills to pay. We're not we're not selling things that you can drive efficiencies out of and, and right. have made in a foreign country. So you're you're in the labor business, you need to be very disciplined. We we call it similar. I heard a great analogy, it's like eating vegetables. They may not taste good, but you need to eat them every day. And, okay, and and you may have, you may you may actually like them eventually, or you may just right. tolerate them. But you, it's the same analogy. Is there a sweet spot? Are you thinking you know two to three percent a year, or is that just? Yeah, how the, I think I think two to five percent. Two to five percent. Okay. Uh, and and if you don't if if you're not doing recurring service. It, it's really how you quote on the phone and here's yeah. what we're going to offer you. And here's the pricing we're going to provide. Yeah. And raising it $5 every year is going to be your probably easy way to make that adjustment. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't have to be a percentage, uh, but it's a way to get, to make sure that you're not, you know, you got to break through these hundred or 200 or $300 thresholds. Yeah. It's just your, it's just your head trash, not theirs. They don't have a clue what it's going to cost. And I mean, if you call and say, here's how we work and here's our cost. And they say, you're crazy. That's way too much money. And you say, well, that's, I understand, sir. And I, you may want to try some other options, but for us to do it the right way, right. that would, cause we're putting, we're putting people on ladders and this is, a, this is a relatively complicated process. Right. And, and you may have people that have sticker shock. Yep, but that's, that's true. part of the deal. Right. Yeah. I've had to try to, in my day job, which is, which isn't part of what I'm doing right now, but I have to sometimes remind people that when they call a contractor, because I don't do, I don't do field, field work as part of my uh, day job, but I have to sometimes remind, let, give them a heads up and just say, just understand if you're hiring someone with liability insurance, with workman's comp insurance, you're going to pay more for that, right? They've got it. They've got to, those things are expensive and they're going to be driving that in. I just try to give them a little heads up. It's like, you'll know, be careful of the low ball price. You know, every, that may be great if the guy doesn't hurt himself, but all of a sudden, if he falls off his ladder and breaks his leg, that, that might come back to you. Yeah. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, after you have something done at your home and I've had a lot done at my home over the, I've lived here for 35 years. Mm. You only remember that you're happy with the result yeah you really yeah. don't remember what you paid you remember that the, 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 the contractor came out the vendor came out and did what they said they were going to do they pruned your shrubs they took care of your gutter yeah. whatever yeah. you needed done i mean i just had my wash machine finally died and i had worked on it for 30 years and for some and uh i had a guy come out and i paid the guy to um autopsy it and tell me it was dead 
<laughs> but I didn't have to keep working on it. I said it was one hundred and forty dollars for me to anoint it. <laughs> so, but, but but again, um, you know, he I had to buy a new one, and it was it was I should have just probably done it, but I wanted to make sure. Yeah. It was shot. So um, I put a comforter in it, and that was the death now. So that was, that was kind of uh, my bad. So, okay. But it, was, it, it don't mean nothing. But, but the point being, yeah, you want to raise price routinely. Um, there's just this really easy discipline. It's like get the customer information, breathe when they call, and say, you know what, before we get started, let me get your information. I'm seeing an insect. Okay, sir, before we start, let me get your name and address, your cell phone, and your email address before we even get into what your situation is. And and um, have an office person that's good at getting that, not you on your cell phone in your car, so that you can do it correctly. Now you have their information because you're gonna you're gonna eventually need that anyway, and they're gonna load it into some database that you keep. Mm. You need to know who your customers are. Yeah. Don't even give them information until they ask you um, your demo until you get their demographic information. Yeah. Uh, now, it's, it's, it's amazing how people will just start blathering, you know, what the problem is. And I just need their information first. Sure. And let's talk about the process. If someone decides they look, I I'm looking to sell my business. They want to reach out to you and they're going to say, Bob, uh, I'm looking to sell my business. What do you need? What's the process by which someone comes to you and says, what What do they need to, what should they be thinking about bringing to the table? What do you need from them to start the process so you can bring your expertise to helping them navigate this emotionally and financially challenging situation? So, Stephen, we stole that expression, and and this is very regional. But in Philadelphia, we had we were doing a uh, we had a process with our basketball team, and the owner would constantly say, "Trust the process." Mm -hmm. And his process didn't work, by the way. We had a plan that we would lose the most games for three years in a row, right. and always get the first draft pick. Right. In the NBA, the first three draft picks are notably better than the next three. It's just it's a quick decline in the yeah, draft. Right. So we were like, we're going to just pick really early, and we're going to just lose eighty percent of our games to do that. And that <laughs> his process was to just have these three years where we just were in the basement to get a really good draft pick, and we would draft it. Unfortunately, we would draft the wrong person, so it didn't work. But that was the process. But our process is is very specific, and we have a, a, a sheet to put it on. We start with a value range analysis. First, we everything starts with a confidentiality agreement, boilerplate agreement, although attorneys are going to kill me for that one, where yeah. you, you find something that's where we're both going to keep all information confidential. Yeah. Any, any broker of any legitimacy is going to do that with you. Yeah. Um, so you sign that, and then they say, then we say, give us a little bit of information, and we do a complementary value range analysis, which is a rough estimate that your business is going to be worth between one million and one point three million dollars. This is what we think would be a good expectation. If you think it's worth five million, we're going to say, you know, we're probably not a good fit. <laughs> okay. um, but it's important for us to give you a VRA. Yeah. A value range analysis in our terminology. Right. So you say that's that's good. I they always they inherently like the high number. <laughs> I like that high number, which is human nature. Sure. So then we say, well, that that's very doable, but you know, we're gonna here's what we're gonna need. And then we would do a consulting agreement, which is our fee schedule, yeah. where we charge a little bit up front because we do a ton of heavy lifting to get it ready to go. Not that we get some money. And then we get paid when we launch it again and when there's an LOI, a letter of intent sign. But we get a percent like a realtor of the value mm -hmm. of the business, which varies on the size, anywhere between 7%, maybe 8% for a really small. But in that 7% down to 5% of the value of the business is our range, of which is pretty, which is pretty normal for our industry. Yeah. So we get that, you sign that and says you have to give us exclusivity 
We're the only guys selling your business. You can't like find a buyer. If you find a buyer, give them to us and we'll work with them. And that we have a year to do that unless we are negligent. Right. So we have it for one year. And we can release you earlier if you want, if it works out that way. But we we sell ninety over ninety percent, if not ninety-five percent of what we what we list. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, That's so we get that together and we put together a coffee table book about your business ready and we put together kind of a Dropbox called a shared file where we have all your information, everything, your financials, we redact any demographic information and we get all that together. And then we, we send out a teaser that says um, mid Atlantic uh, wildlife business for sale, $1.2 million with a quarter million dollar EBITDA with a little bit of teaser information, not even Pennsylvania, not even Jersey. Right. We just want to give you a broad brush. We're not going to disclose who you are to anyone. Right. So then people say, I want no, I want to know more. I want, I'm interested in this mid-Atlantic company. So then they sign a CA, the buyer signs a CA, a confidentiality agreement. Yeah. The seller approves them to see it. The seller may, it may be his brother-in-law who he hates, or they might <laughs> They don't want to sell to. Them. It's rare, but it sure, happens. It happens, yeah. <laughs> and we redact stuff that we don't want them to see at this point. Yeah. So we give them all that information. We let them into the into the data room. We call it where all the data is, and they can look at it. They can ask questions. They can poke through it. We can see what they're up to in there, and um, and we do some FAQs if they start asking questions. We do an FAQ and we send it to all the potential buyers. So the buyers all go in there at the same time. They obviously can't see each other. And then we do it. Then we do a deadline for a letter of. Intent. So a letter of intent is a is just an offer, a non-binding offer that says, here's what I would be willing to pay based on what I think I know right. under the term. So we have an LOI deadline. We might give them seven or eight days after we see that they're all in looking at it, then we then we announce here's the deadline of your LOI. So then we get all the LOIs in. The goal is to get several. Right. And then we work with the seller with the LOIs and we meet the best offers and we work through the process with them. So we kind of go back to them and they meet each other confidentially in a hotel somewhere that we rent. And then we have meetings so that they can drive up and get a better sense for the buyer gets to meet the seller and they can ask those questions. Okay. And does the, uh, does the buyer have to show proof of financial ability or is that uh, just sort of, or. Yes and no. We typically vet out the buyer to make sure that they have it. Um, uh, most of the buyers we deal with have bought other businesses. Okay. So they're, they're, Experienced buyers are a little easier, sure. although we do mentor new buyers is a common practice where a person's never bought a business yeah. and, and they need us to help them put an offer together, which mm-hmm. is kind of awkward because we're representing the seller. Yeah. So, you know, so it's, it's, but at the end of the day, we want to train them. So we're, we're okay giving them some guidance over where we think they need to get to. Now, if someone in our audience said, you know, Bob, I'm looking, not looking to sell my business. I'm looking to buy a business. Right. Can they hire you as their their buyer broker or is that some other person in your company? We are, we are not a buy side because it's a conflict. We can only represent one party. I so gotcha. we don't okay. buy side work. They, what we do for them, Stephen, is we put them on our list. So anything we get in your area, we're going to send you. We're going to send, okay. We're going to send you opportunities and I will Mm. sit with them and tell them, and I did this for 35 years. How do you find businesses to buy? Because I bought over 35 and 75% of them were direct and the other 25% I dealt with brokers. Okay. I bought most of my stuff directly because I was pretty good at developing leads. Yeah. Now, do you think, for how you do that? Do you think they're, is it has been an increased interest in buying pest control businesses as you know the stock market's been kind of going crazy i remember i got a call from a stock analyst who was who was working for some 
I, I think an investment, I think a private equity firm, and he was looking at evaluating a major uh, pest control franchise, I believe, to invest in their in their stock, and yeah. he wanted my opinion on things, and I, I, I think that they were looking for a place to buy stock that would have regular cash flow and just keep those, you know, dividends coming and it just sort of like, and they were expanding. Are you seeing that in the industry at all? Yeah, we have a, a, for the right businesses, Stephen, in, in the right market with the right pricing and the right kind of programs in place, we have a significant appetite of many buyers. Gotcha. We, so, have, we have buyers constantly calling us saying, what do you have? I'm looking for businesses to buy. Okay. So our job is to get them in front of the opportunities we have. So gotcha. if I go to a show and I'll sit there, I'll have for every seller that finds me and they usually find me away from my booth because they don't want to talk in public. I'll have 10 buyers come up to my booth and say, I, I want to buy somebody in Oklahoma City or I want to buy somebody in Topeka, Kansas or wherever they are at. So they're interested in that market. And I say, give me your name and I'll put you on our list so that anything we get, you can take a look at. Right. So we want, them, we want all of them looking. They, they, um, we want all of them looking at the same time. Okay. Right. Do right. people usually have to have their own financing or do sellers sometimes finance the sale themselves or. Is... Uh, in most cases, um, they have to have their own financing and we typically vet that out in the process as a seller's agent. Yeah. So our job is as we write the as as we get once they accept the LOI, we vet them out and then we will work through the asset purchase agreement with the with the attorneys. We're not their attorneys. We have two attorneys, non practicing attorneys on our staff that'll help like redline all these mm -hmm. documents. Yeah. But we'll help them in their document make sure that that all is taken care of. Sure. Okay. Any. Thing you'd like to we've covered a lot of material here today anything in closing that we haven't talked about or something that you would like to talk about or anything you'd like to re-emphasize uh before we finish up our time together so so my bullet points Stephen, for um what you can do now to add value is to think about ways you can sell recurring services and you don't have to have a big program but there's a way to get things scheduled ahead of time so that every year you're coming out. I mean, I had a guy clean my windows. We were having a party and uh, I said, can you just like, do you have a program where I can have this done twice a year or three times a year? He said, no, I just kind of, people just call me to do their windows. I said, well, I kind of like you to just do this without me having to call you. Wow. And, and and he was like, no, no, I'm good. I just, I, you know, I, I'm busy enough. So yeah. I mean, this, I'm trying to buy a program and the guy won't <laughs> So, so, you know, so, and I, cause I don't want to have to remember to call him. And, and if right. he called me today and said, Hey, we're, we're scheduled to come out and do your windows. I would say, great. Next week is good. Right. right? right. And he's doing a, and he's going to do them with my neighbor's windows. Right. He's going to make more money. So, right. so, right. So programs are, it's, it's not as complicated as perhaps you're thinking. Yep. Secondly is raise your prices routinely. Work on um, SOPs for your jobs. Develop SOPs for the way you do work, standard operating procedures. Yeah, operating procedures. And don't overthink SOPs. They change. Don't, this is not an end game. You write them down and you change them. And, and you can make improvements. You can take stuff in and take it out. So whatever you have is, is a fluid document. Yeah. There's great there's, there's a thing called Word that lets you edit it as many times as you want. Right. So, yeah, so don't, don't make it don't make it onerous that this yeah. is a big deal. I mean, we have people with multiple people. We have them do org charts, and, and we can do an org chart in 10 minutes, but it really helps us understand where everybody fits. Right, right. We go to sell your business. We have a little org chart that says here's, here's the layout of the land. So there are things like that that can really help you with your business yeah that's some uh great great advice i yeah i was just contract i was contracted by a company to do some some work along those uh 
standard operating procedures is probably, yeah a little bit uh in in that particular area as well as you know their mode of operation on some things and it's not as hard as people think but if you don't want to do it reach out to me and I can certainly help you with that. Well, Mr. Williamson, we're really glad to have you on board here. Let me kind of give your contact information again. You've been listening to Bob Williamson. He is the director of the Pest Control Division of CETANE Associates. That's spelled C-E-T-A-N-E. And you can visit his site at CETANE, C-E-T-A-N-E, Dot com and reach out to them so they're they're quite attentive sometimes when i request guests uh it's like a black hole not the case with uh, uh mr williamson here he was able to reach out and uh, was was really glad that he did because i think this information is really important and i really appreciate you taking the time to share that with our audience so ctain.com if you're looking to sell your business definitely check check him out and if you're looking to buy a business you may want to be on his on his list if he gets a gets a hold of companies he can bring you into the loop because uh we're not getting any younger here folks so you better prepare for retirement and yeah it's something you want to think about at least three years out but you should be thinking about it even now many multiple years in the head well thank you very much really appreciate your time so you've been listening to living the wildlife as part of the pest geek podcast family do take a few moments if you would to subscribe to the channel uh ring the bell and of course if you have questions comments yes even criticisms you can reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com thanks everyone for listening this is living the wildlife why do they call it living the wildlife well because we want you to live the wildlife not be the wildlife take care everybody Thank you, Stan. Thank you.